Good evening, my name's Michael and I'm doing this stream tonight to refute Hamza. Um, Hamza's den's been on and he's basically, he spoke to a Christian and Hamza is saying Isaiah 53 is not speaking about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. I'm on here today now to refute that argument and to provide the evidence for that. So that's what I'm going to do. So the first thing I'm going to do is go to Isaiah 53. And I do suggest buying a study Bible or go onto Bible Hub. And that gives you commentaries by different people about, about this particular passage. So I'm just going to look at Isaiah 3. So it says here, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no stately form or majesty to attract us, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took on our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, struck down and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can recount his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was stricken for the transgression of my people. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And when his soul is made a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the anguish of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong. Because he has poured out his life unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Okay. So that's Isaiah 53. Now, when we go to the commentary on Isaiah 53, this is what it's actually saying, and this is the interpretation, okay? We have here a prophetic paradox that the mightiest revelation of the arm of the Lord is in weakness. The words of the text stand in closest connection with the great picture of the suffering servant which follows and the prophetic figure portrayed there is the revealing of the arm of the Lord. The close bringing together of the ideas of majesty and power and of humiliation, suffering and weakness would be a paradox to the first hearers of the prophecy. Its solution lies in historical manifestation of Jesus Looking on him, we see that the growing up of that root out of a dry ground was the revelation of the great power of God. In Jesus' lowly humanity, God's power is made perfect in man's weakness. In another and not less true sense than that in which the apostle spoke. There we see divine power in its noblest form, in its grandest operation, in its widest sweep, in its loftiest purpose. That humble man, lowly and poor, despised and rejected in life, hanging fate and pallid on the Roman cross and dying in the dark seems a strange manifestation of the glory of God. But the cross is indeed his throne 
and sublim as are the other forms in which omniscient clothes itself, this is to humanise and hearts the highest of them all. In Jesus, the arm of the Lord is revealed in its grandest operation. Creation and the continuous sustaining of the universe are great, but redemption is greater. It is infinitely more to say, he giveth power to the faint, than to say, for that he is strong in might. Not one faileth, and to principalities and powers in heavenly places, who have gazed on the grand operations of divine power for ages. New lessons of what it can affect are taught by the redemption of sinful men. The divine power that is enshrined in Jesus' weaknesses is power in its widest sweep. For it is to everyone that believes, and it is its loftiest person, for, for it is unto salvation. Amen. So, if you look at Isaiah 53, in this Bible here, this is a King James Bible, and at the front of this Bible, we have, if you can see on the screen there where I'm pointing, we have these two stars. Now, the, the unshaded star is all verses in the Old Testament that refer to the coming of the Messiah and Mark with a star. And the dark star here, if you can see just there, you can read it yourself. Move my finger. Um, all verses in the New Testament that fulfil a messianic prophecy are indicated by a, a star that's that's being coloured in. Okay, so in Isaiah fifty three, I've counted one, two, three, four, four messianic prophecies in Isaiah fifty three alone, and I'll just point to them. So you can see, let's get this on camera. Okay. Okay. You see the stars going down the side of the page? Okay. Now this is like a study Bible. Now, when we go to Psalm 22 verse 6, as it says on the screen here, Isaiah 53 verse 3 matches Psalm 22 verse 6 perfectly. And this is what it says in uh, Psalm 22, verse 6. But I'm a worm, and no man a reproach of men, and despised of the people. So in Isaiah 53, it says he is despised. So it's talking about Jesus being despised. Okay. Um, I'm going to make another point here. If we go to the New Testament, just give me one second, I've got it bookmarked here. If we go to the New Testament, in Matthew twenty-seven fifty-seven, it talks about Jesus being buried in a rich man's tomb, which is Joseph's tomb. So it's a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, and he became a disciple of Jesus. So if you read the prophecy of Isaiah 53, it talks about him being buried in a rich man's tomb. So we see the fulfillment in the New Testament. Okay. Now, <coughs> Pardon me. So that's. I'll just go to another one in Matthew. Matthew twenty-seven, forty-six says. Okay. Matthew twenty-seven, forty-six says. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, "Eli, Eli, lama." Sabbathani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there, when they heard that, said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. 
So when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting Psalm 22. And Psalm 22 backs up Isaiah 53. Okay. So... So in Psalm 22, verse 8, it says, Let him deliver him. Matthew 27, 43 says, He says, He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now. So you see this parallel language. Okay. Give me one second. Okay. In Isaiah 53, 4, it says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. If you go to Matthew 8, book of Matthew 8, verse 17. It says this. It says, when evening, we'll go from Matthew 8, 16. Sorry, Matthew 8, 16. Onwards, when evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Okay, so in Matthew, it's affirming Isaiah 53. As Jesus being that prophecy, and in Matthew we see the fulfilment of it being fulfilled. Okay. Now it says in Isaiah 53, verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her, shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. Matthew 26, 63. Matthew 26, 63. Says this. He says, we'll go to 62. And the high priest arose and said to him, do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Noticed he Jesus kept silent in Matthew 26, 63. And in Isaiah 53, 7, it says, he opened not his mouth. Okay. Isaiah 53, verse 9 says, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit found in his mouth. Matthew it talks about Jesus being buried in a rich man's tomb. Wow. He made his grave with the wicked. He was numbered with the transgressors. So this parallel, parallel language that we're looking at here in Matthew and also in the Psalms matches. We have a prophecy, Isaiah 53, and it's fulfilled in the New Testament. So Hamza made the argument that, well, the Jews were not looking for a, a Messiah 
that would come in the way that Jesus came. Let me tell you this, they had the wrong idea of who the Messiah was because Jesus said that he visited them and he said, you did not know the time of your coming. You did not know. I will now find that verse for you to back up what I'm saying. You did not know. Because if you did, the time of your coming, okay. So, Luke 19, 44 says this. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognise the time of God's coming to you. They rejected their Messiah. In the book of John, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He came to his own, but his own did not accept him. So he was rejected by men, as it says in Isaiah 53. Rejected by men, he came to his own, his own did not accept him. And Jesus says, you did not recognise the time of God's coming to you. So Jesus is this true Messiah, because Jesus said, after me, there will be false Christs, false messiahs. He was the true Messiah that came. And he fulfilled Isaiah 53 and what was written about him in the Psalms. I recommend this book. It's called the Bible Handbook, the Lion Concise Bible Handbook. And it's got a wealth of information. So in Psalm 22, the Psalm Jesus quoted as he hung on the cross, verse 1 which is parallel to Matthew 27, 46, is the most amazing example. Compare verse 16 with John 20, 25. Verse 18 with Mark 15 to 24. See Psalm 69, 20 on Matthew 27, 34 to 48. There are also many other verses in the Psalms which New Testament writers apply to Jesus as the Christ. So Psalm 2, verse 7 says, You are my son. Acts 13, 33 says... Go to the book of Acts. Acts 13, 33 says this. God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he have raised up Jesus again, as it is also written... In the second psalm, thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Okay. And then we've got psalm 8, verse 6, and it says, all things under his feet. So let's go to psalm 8, verse 6. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. And the book of Hebrews says, Hebrews 2, verses 6 to 10 says this. Book of Hebrews. He says, but there is a place where someone has testified. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? A son of man that you care for him. You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honour. And put everything under their feet. 
In putting everything under them, God left nothing. Sorry, I'm reading the wrong translation here. He says, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. So there we see it's subjection under his feet. Psalm 45 verse 6 says, Your throne, O God, endures forever. Hebrews 1 verse 8. The Father is talking to the Son. He says to the Son, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So, Psalm 118.22 talks about the stone which the builders have rejected. Matthew 21.42 talks about the stone which the builders have rejected. The stone in the Bible is talking of God. And Jesus is known as this stone, stone of stumbling, a rock of offence. Indeed, despised and rejected a man. So, when you look deep into the Bible, you'll see the, all these parallels and that it, that's what it's speaking about, Jesus Christ. God bless you. Thank you.